Welcome to our Microbiology Journal Club. So this is our journal club for March. This is March 23rd right now. Um, you wouldn't really be able to tell it from Providence because it's still really cold outside. I'm not excited about that. I'm, I'm ready for spring. So we'll hopefully get some warmer weather soon. Uh, today we're going to be talking about this paper, which is Experimental Evolution of Escherichia coli Harboring an Ancient Translation Protein. So this is really cool because it involves reconstructing ancient sequences and then putting them into a modern genome and experimentally evolving them in the lab to see what happens. So this has given me all kinds of fodder to make Encino Man jokes, which I'm very excited about. Hooray. Um, but also, in its own right, it's a very interesting piece of work. And it's something that we are thinking about in my lab because we're planning to do some experimental evolution projects. So this is a good thing for me to read. And this is one of the reasons why I picked it is because we're thinking about experimental evolution for our predatory bacteria research. So before we get started, I'll introduce myself. My name is Laura Williams. I'm an assistant professor at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and currently we are working in my lab on two research tracks. We have a microbiome research track and then we also study predatory bacteria, which are bacteria that attack and digest other bacteria. That's one of the primary ways they get their nutrients. So we're looking at those bacteria and we'll be examining some of, um, using experimental evolution approaches to kind of examine changes in phenotype and if we can tie that to changes in genotype. And so with that, I will uh, let Nicole introduce herself. All right, hello everyone. I'm Nicole Sukdio, a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for the last few years, I've been working on a soil trenching type experiment in a subboreal spruce forest using microbiome uh, methods, basically, to look at changes in fungal and bacterial communities and learning that we're basically tracking the same things that you could find with fruiting bodies 30 years ago and that the bacteria pretty much don't really care except for a few weeks after you cause problems. Just as an aside, how's, how is all that going? How is, is it coming? Are you, um, cause it, it seems like that, that you've done a lot of data analysis. Are you guys headed towards a public, should we, we be watching for a publication so coming up? We're ju we just, um, well, I just sent one of our manuscripts to basically stakeholder review. That's one of the things in our process before it goes out to a journal. So we're getting close with one of them. Um, my contract actually ends in a month. So I'm doing the whole try to write papers quickly and try to find a job kind of thing right now. So it's, it's a bit chaotic, but like we're hoping that good things will happen with our fungal manuscript. And if not, then, you know, you be humble and try and see what first level is at, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, there's a plug then. Hire Nicole. Nicole's great. <laughs> well, it'll look greater when there's evidence of productivity, but um... that's true for everybody, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, speaking of which, I do want to give a, a quick shout out to um, some of the folks who are our regulars. So, for instance, Karen, my um, my frequent co-host, Karen Lowe, she is uh, going to be defending next week for her PhD. She's a graduate student. And she is giving her defense practice talk tomorrow, I think. And then I believe next Friday, Karen is defending. So we'll just do a shout out to Karen to say uh, hello and to wish her luck with that because that is a, a big deal. And I know this is the time when, when all the, everything's building to this. So Karen is very understandably focused on that. Um, we've got a couple other people who may pop in to join us. So we'll see if they um, show up over the course of the journal club. As it always is with this time of the year and the time of the semester, everybody's got lots of things popping up and so forth. Um, but we're going to get started talking about this paper. So um, I just, I, I was really happy to read this and start thinking about these ideas. I will say that part of my interest in this, I've actually had interest in evolution, um, in experimental evolution for some time now. So it's something that I proposed to do for a postdoc, but that didn't get funded. And so I went on to do an equally interesting project somewhere else. But then I was able to, a couple of years ago, attend a, a meeting at Nescent, which was at Durham, 
North Carolina at that point. I don't believe that center is, is still going on right now, that National Evolutionary Synthesis Center. Uh, but at that time, they were working on uh, evolution ecological questions. And so some folks had proposed a meeting on long-term evolution experiments. So I got to go to that meeting and uh, talk to a lot of people who are at different stages of their careers. So people who've been, you know, Rich Lenski was there, who is really well known for the long-term E. coli evolution experiment. And a lot of other people, including the, the first author of this paper, I met her there. And um, so it's exciting to kind of see her work coming out of, of her long long-standing interest in experimental evolution and then it's also neat for me to be thinking about the fact that our lab is very shortly going to be moving into that as well so it's really neat for me to see all this experimental evolution stuff happening um, in this paper what they're basically doing is combining that experimental evolution approach with um, another one of the first author's interests which is ancient proteins so the idea here is looking at you, what they chose to do was to use phylogenetic sequence information to reconstruct the likely sequence of an elongation factor gene from about 700 million years ago. So if you start with modern E. coli, and then you think about, okay, 700 million years ago, there was an ancestor of what we know now as E. coli, we can try to use existing gene sequence information to build ourselves a phylogeny and then track back through these nodes to try to figure out what is the most likely amino acid sequence and then therefore nucleotide gene sequence that that ancestor had. And so this is really resurrecting what's pro the proposed sequence for a 700 million year old um, protein that's involved in protein synthesis. So this is elongation factor, I think you say it, elongation factor two. I've actually never said it, so I've only ever seen it uh, written. Um, and so that's kind of cool. And so I just, I thought I would mention as a point that 700 million years ago, I went and looked up the, the so I could get it right, the, the proposed split for E. coli and salmonella because those are two gamma proteobacteria that people are familiar with. And I think that's proposed to be about 100 million years ago. So we're backing up even far farther than, you know, the split that gave us E. coli and salmonella. So it's neat to kind of think about being able to track back, reconstruct that sequence, and then what they're going to do is they're going to bring it forward, put it into an e a modern E. coli background, and see what happens. So that's kind of the design of this particular experiment. Um, Nicole, had you read any anything like this before? We were talking about this a little bit before we jumped on here. Um, so this is interesting because I think I'm going to end up going into left field by answering this question, but I don't think really. So to answer your first question, no, I haven't actually read a paper on experimental evolution prior to this one. And I, until I got to figure three where I realized you can't look at figure three on, on a black and white copy, that resurrected itself once I changed it. But the thing that is left field that I thought was really cool is just the week prior to this journal club, I gave a guest lecture where I talked about engineering the art of miscinin, so the anti-malarial drug pathway into Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And one of the things that I did emphasize in that lecture is how many goes it took to not kill your cells because it was actually about regulating these plant gene expression, especially for the redox pathways in that, in that synthesis. So the risk of mucking with a coding sequence, besides all of this sort of like cellular accounting or making sure that things are being expressed at appropriate levels. And the, way, the reason I'm saying this is it links back to really, you know, I'm kind of giving away the end here, which I always seem to do every time I do Journal Club. But um, it's just this idea of risk versus reward when you've got something that's not optimized for the full genome and the full physiology of that um, organism. Because as we see, it's actually promoter mutations that are really going to be the key thing that, that sort of comes out of this experimental evolutionary drift from the time they insert the 700 million year old elongation factor into E. coli. Yeah, so that's definitely. What I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, and I think that I think you've kind of um, led into a good a good point here about which is what they're so what they're doing here is they've got their their ancient their 
yeah, that's what they're calling it, the ancient um, tough gene. So the gene that codes for this elongation factor. So they've got their ancient tough gene and they are putting it into a modern E. coli background. And so as a result of that, they, they are able to ask two specific questions about what happens. One of the questions that they were really interested in as they frame it in the introduction is, could you actually see and reconstruct the evolutionary pathway in the tough gene that led to the modern version that we have now? So if you back all the way up and start with an, an, an ancient tough gene and you put it in a modern genome, will it accumulate the same mutations or start to accumulate some of the same mutations and end up looking like the modern version of the tough gene that was originally in that genome sequence? So that was one of their questions, which is what is what's going to happen to the gene itself? But then, because they can put it in this, this genome as a background, the question is also, what happens to the rest of the genome or the neighborhood? So like if you thaw out Brendan Fraser and you throw him into like Encino, California, what, how does Brendan Fraser adapt and then how does Encino, California adapt around him? So, so that's also looking at what are called compensatory mutations, which are what kind of mutations accumulate in the rest of the genome to try to deal with the fact that, they, that this genome now has a maladapted protein synthesis, gene involved with protein synthesis. So I think they got those, those the ability to ask those two questions is, is really interesting with this particular experiment. Yeah, and as you pointed out, the, 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 the results of all this, you know, these two questions were I think maybe a little unexpected, uh, but we'll, we'll go back to that. Um, all right, so I did from the introduction, I did have a couple of things that I, I'd circled as things that were worth bringing up to my mind. Um, one of them is in, in, the, in the kind of the second page of the introduction, right here they start talking about um, the criteria and the conditions for this particular experiment. So they explain a little bit, I think, why they selected this tough gene. So there are many genes in E. coli that you could have chosen to do this experiment, and they went ahead and went with this elongation factor gene. And they talk about needing, um, they're going to do this in bacteria because it has a short generation time. So if you're trying to experimentally evolve something in the lab, you really don't want something that takes forever, like you don't want to do this with mice. You know, you really want to do this with bacteria that have a quick generation time. But then they also mentioned that they wanted to do it with a protein that was under strong selective constraints. So I think the idea here is that this elongation factor, because it's so important for protein synthesis, is going to be under strong selection. And I actually wondered what would have happened if they'd chosen something that was under not a strong selection. Um, I, I definitely see why they picked one that was under strong selective constraints because you kind of figure that if it's maladapted, the organism is going to, the, the cells are going to be less fit. So there's going to be a selective pressure to try to accumulate some mutations to deal with that. Um, but I kind of wondered what would happen, I mean, I think this might get into like neutral evolution and so forth, but what would have happened if you'd pick something that the selective, uh, the selection coefficient on it was, was lower, that it wasn't experiencing quite as strong of a selective constraint? I don't know if that's anything, Nicole, you have any thoughts about, but. Okay, so like, I'm going to embarrass myself by saying that like. That was I great. I liked you like, you're like, I gotta get ready for this. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm one of those people who made it all the way to a PhD without taking any molecular evolution. And what I interviewed for my job here, I was told that any decent biology instructor should be able to teach that course. And then I kept my mouth shut because I'm like, you should just fire me right now. Um, but they don't know it doesn't hurt them. Know. Well, they found out two years later. Um, not by teaching, I think I just told them over lunch. But like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, this is... So I'm going to diverge from the evolution, oh pun intended, about that um, ah. a little bit. Um, but I think I think this is actually really interesting to talk about this idea of like weaker selection. But I'm assuming you mean weaker selection, but probably constitutively expressed because you'd need something that wasn't context dependent, right? I mean, sure. that's that's yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're also dealing with you know it's it's a bacterial genome, so like you can't really separate coding sequence from functionality. I mean, what we're really talking about is like something where there's such a low, there's no, well, 
how am I going to put this? The interpretation of what's there and what we're mucking with, in this case, the elongation factor, as far as what it translates into as far as physiology. Like, there really isn't anything else that's going to mitigate that other than tough B, which we also talk about in the paper. Right. Um, so that is a very, I mean, I don't, I don't know that much about neutral evolution, but it would be kind of interesting to see, like, whether that's something that would be pushed or pulled by media conditions, if it's something that's more or less weakly selected, like you might actually find out something about emerging sensitivities. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's as far as I think I'm going to leave it so that we can discuss yeah. more what happens. Yeah. And, that, and I, I mean, I'll say that I, I completed my PhD with, with some reading into molecular evolution. And then in my postdoc, um, I that was my postdoc was lots of molecular evolution fr learned from somebody Jen Werner Green who is that's boy that's her wheelhouse she's she's excellent at that um, and so we were studying bacterial endosymbionts looking at um, specifically she wanted to look at the idea of like nearly neutral selection so you've got strong selection you've got neutral selection and then you've got something that's kind of, if you're looking at selection coefficients, you've got something that's kind of in the middle, you know, and that was the space that she was looking at in terms of genes that are in these bacterial endosymbionts. Um, so yeah, you could really, you could really go into it with the theory behind um, selective constraints, how it affects different genes, how it affects evolutionary trajectories and pathways, mutational pathways that are even available to those sequences. And that's always a concept I found really interesting, which is you start with a sequence, and then theoretically, every one of those positions could mutate in a bunch of different directions. But really, that's not what's going to happen, because that's all of those pathways sit on a fitness landscape in which most of your changes are going to plummet it off the fitness landscape. And if it makes that change, it's going to die. But you get, can get these stepwise changes that kind of try to shift you over to a another peak in your fitness landscape. And I think, Nicole, what you were just suggesting is that fitness landscape is really dependent on a lot of other things that are going on, which are like media conditions. So the, the fitness peaks and the fitness valleys might shift if you move that cell into entirely different media conditions or temperatures or, and they talk about this in the discussion of the paper, that certainly knowing the conditions in which you're growing an organism and a lineage is going to impact the way these mutational pathways sit on fitness peaks and fitness valleys. So I think all of that, I think all of that made sense. Um, yeah. So I see Kat's joined us. I know that she's, uh, she's recovering from the dentist, so we won't make her, we won't make her say anything. Um, but if you want to jump in, Kat, feel free. Um, okay. So yeah, so we'll keep that in mind as we're kind of talking about the outcome of the evolved lineages. But then also, and, and Nicole, you brought this up. So in the paper, they talk about the fact that E. coli, modern E. coli, actually has two copies of a tough gene. They have tough A and tough B. So um, I thought it was, so it, they do say that um, the protein, the, trend, the elongation factor produced through tough B accounts for one third of the cellular elongation factor as that produced by the tough A gene in bacteria. So it sounds like tough A is the primarily the one that's expressed to give you elongation factor, but you do get some expression of tough B. So then they say that they actually, in this E. coli genome, they deleted tough A and then they replaced tough B with the ancient version that they had reconstructed and they put it under control of the modern tough B promoter. And so when I read that, I thought, that's really interesting. And I kind of wish they'd talked a little bit more about why that, that was the strategy that they chose. I was curious why they didn't knock out tough B and then replace tough A with their, with their ancient gene so that the ancient gene would be under the control of the tough A promoter. I wasn't entirely sure why they chose tough B. I don't know, Nicole, did you, did you have any thoughts on that? I'm actually really glad that you clarified that because there's a couple things I struggled with. So like now I know that that happened and that is, it is an excellent question because I mean, so 
are there any studies where they actually make ancient promoters and then see what the gene does? Because that's, I mean, like it really doesn't matter in this case because they still ended up using a modern elongation factor promoter anyhow. Right. Um, I wonder if it's the case that they actually did it, but the data didn't make the cut because something was going on with the with the expression of EF2 in that strain. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wonder oh, about yeah. that too. So I, I'm not sure, but that's, yeah, I feel a bit embarrassed because that didn't really clue into me until now, but I'm also glad that I know now. And it is a good question. Um, it would be interesting to contact the authors and ask about that. Yeah, and I think she, I think I might just inquire about that um, with her and just see what she what she says about I'm sh you know my guess is just like you said my guess is there's uh, there's a lot of work that went into this and the outcome of having a deleted tough A and a replaced tough B uh, my my guess is there's a lot that went into having that be the outcome that they're testing here. Um, but then, yeah, your point is really interesting. So in this case, what they've got is the, in, because they did not reconstruct the promoter sequence. They just reconstructed the, the nucleotide, the gene sequence. So to express that gene, it's going to be under the control of a modern E. coli tough promoter. So that's a couple things to think about as, as the experiment ramps up here and we look at some of the results. Um, okay. I think that is all that I had noted in the intro. Was there, Nicole, was there anything else that you'd picked up on that you want to cover? Um, I think you, you got pretty much everything there okay. that I, I thought was noteworthy, so, so that's cool. Okay, awesome. And then also, always, Kat, if you want to jump in, feel free. Otherwise, we'll leave, we'll leave you alone to recover. Um, okay, so... What they did, first of all, once they've got their construct, which they refer to as their hybrid. So ancient modern hybrid means tough A is gone, tough B is replaced with an ancient tough B. And that's their ancient modern hybrid. They also, as a way of trying to give themselves a control, they have a modern E. coli that has the, basically the first step of that process. They knocked out the tough A gene and left the, uh, the modern tough B intact. And they've got that lineage as well as a control for looking at how the removal or the deletion of tough A affects the, the, the cells and affects the population. Um, so one of the first things they wanted to do was to look at uh, what altering those, those genomes in that way, how that affected fitness. So let me see if I can get to my screensaver or screen share. I know I can do it. Chat, screen share, perfect. There we go. So I'm going to shift over really quickly to sharing my screen. Um, and I think hopefully you guys can see the paper there. And so what we're going to look at is the first, I'll try not to scroll too fast so I don't make anybody dizzy. Um, oh, well, that's a good thing to see. This is just looking at the differences between the um, modern and the ancient, oh good, everybody can see it. Okay, the modern and the ancient sequences at, at the protein level. So we're looking at 21 amino acid differences that are shown kind of in the white. So the red boxes, the red box letters are um, positions where the protein sequence is the same between the modern and the ancient tough sequence. And then they're showing the locations of the differences in the sequence. And then as Nicole pointed out, they did a lot of work to try to tie those to um, structure. So what they're showing here in panel B is the ribbon diagram of what the protein would look like. And in red, they've identified the variants or the residues that are different in the ancient versus the modern. And so I think then C, they're arguing that quite a few of those are going to be involved in interaction with the 70S ribosome. So here, these changed residues that are different between the modern and the ancient could, be, could play an important role and a significant role in terms of how this elongation factor protein actually interacts with the 70S ribosome. Um, I think that pretty much covers that panel. I think I'm glad they, they included that to give us a, an actual 
sense of the context of these, of these amino acid differences. So then what they did was they said, okay, well, we've got our constructs, we've got our hybrid, and we've got our knockout, and we want to see what it does to fitness. So uh, I read this last night, and then I took my brain a little bit to kind of figure out that this, that this figure is actually kind of, you should primarily think about this figure as split into two parts. The left side of the, of the y-axis just basically shows you the, um, the reduction in fitness compared to the wild type if you've got a tough A knockout, which is around the 0.9, and if you've replaced the tough B modern gene with the ancient tough version, and that reduces the fitness even more. So things that they know from this is that fortunately, replacing tough with an ancient sequence does not kill the cells entirely, so that's good. Otherwise, there would be fitness of zero. Um, but it does reduce the fitness compared to a modern genome where the tough gene has been evolving alongside its neighbor genes for all this time. So shooting the tough back to 700 million years ago does not uh, do happy things for this, for this strain's fitness at all. So then what they want to do is they want to look at the, how the fitness changes over time if they evolve these lineages in the lab. So this is where the experimental evolution part of it comes into it. So they're gonna take replicate populations, they're gonna just sit them in a flask in uh, glucose minimal medium, they're going to let them shake in their incubator, and then I think they said every day they did a 100-fold dilution into new minimal medium. And so their calculation is this is about six generations per day. So they're kind of, uh, that's how they're able to get the x-axis to show the number of generations over time. Um, and one thing that I wasn't certain about is when you get into the right part of the, of the figure, so to the right of the y-axis, I could not tell if they were calculating relative fitness to the wild type or relative fitness to the original, um, the original genotype or the original founder of the of the lineage because they would have that in the freezer so they could bring it back out at 500 generations and test the ancestor the ancestral uh, genotype against the evolved one I think this is getting a little confusing because we're using the word ancient and I'm also using the word ancestral uh, but basically what I'm saying here is they do have their time zero in the freezer and then they've got their 500 generation time point that they could basically compete their 500 generation lineages against their time zero lineages. And I think that's what they did to, to test the change in fitness. I think that makes more sense than competing against the wild type, but I wasn't entirely I'm, sure. I'm just going to say that I agree with your interpretation mainly because I think that like, again, that overall regulatory context for having this now ancient elongation factor, you'd want to compare it to to the new or the, the generation one for sure instead of, um, I guess, the E. coli, I guess I'll call it chassis that's completely modern. Right. In quotation marks. Right. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense because what you're looking for yeah. there is, is uh, what you're expecting to have happen is some, some adaptation and so you're expecting to see a change in fitness compared to what you started with that was originally exposed to this, this environment, and then you're kind of evolving it over lineages. Okay, so I wanted to, I wanted to confirm that, but I think that that makes the most sense. Um, so what you actually see here is that we are getting, so Kat's got a point here, she says they're comparing it to RHEL 606, right? Yeah, that's what, that is the parent strain. And that's, I think that's what we're trying to decide. Are they, for the 500 generation time point, are they comparing it back to RHEL 606, the parent strain on its own? Or are they comparing it back to the time zero? Um, okay, hmm. Because then if, that, if they're comparing it back to RHEL 606, I'm kind of surprised that, I th I'm kind of surprised that it's increasing its fitness compared to the wild type even though it's got this, uh, this ancient gene in there. So I'm just basing this all of what Kat is sending me by, uh, by chat here. Um, 
So here's what Kat says. A RHEL 607 strain was acclimated to the competition environment by separate growth under the... Oh, shoot. I lost your chat thing. Let me see if I can bring it up. Aha. There we go. All right. So it says um, a RHEL 607 strain... This is from Kat. A RHEL 607 strain was acclimated to the competition environment by separate growth under the same environmental conditions as RHEL 606 uh, with a tough A, tough B deletion. And EF harboring P ask IBA43 with the ancient EFTU genes. I wonder, I want, is that a different experiment? Is that their, um, I think, is that involving the um, induction when they were looking at changes in protein expression, the P ask stuff? That's what I'm not sure about. Ah, okay. All right, so I think I think what Kat's thinking about is, um, yeah, okay. So I think what Kat's pointing to, um, she skipped ahead a couple figures to the protein expression stuff, uh, where they do in fact do a comparison against the wild type. So I'm thinking that our conclusion that this is probably tracking relative fitness as compared to time zero. So you're looking at improvement in fitness over time compared to the how the um, the hybrid first came into the flask. I think that's what's going on. So we'll go forward with that in mind. And if 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 uh, if we get corrected, I'll definitely uh, mm -hmm. I'll definitely let people know. All right. So but then what they wanted to know is do they um, so what you can actually see is it, is it is adapting. So we're basically seeing an increase in fitness over time for both the tough A knockout, so the modern E. coli genome that's gotten its tough A knocked out, it's going to improve in fitness over time. But then also the ancient modern hybrid is going to improve in fitness over time. So then they want to know, all right, well, what's actually happening? So they do whole genome sequencing at these different time points, and they're looking for the number of mutations that are occurring. So they've got the lineages shown here color-coded. They're tracking um, six lineages. And I think these are all six. All six of the colored lineages, I think, are um, hybrid lineages. So they're ancient, modern. They're modern E. coli that have an ancient tough gene in them. And they're looking to see, do their pathways, do they accumulate mutations at the same rate? Do they accumulate different numbers of mutations? Here they're just, I think this is kind of looking to see what's the role of chance um, in the response of this hybrid to its conditions and how it adapts and evolves. Um, one of the things that I didn't, I didn't follow with this is I thought this was the number of mutations accumulated, but if you look at the red lineage, lineage, lineage two, it actually drops in the number of mutations from 500 to 1,000 generations. So I wasn't sure if this meant the accumulated number of mutations or if it was the number of new mutations that they saw since the previous time point. That, that I wasn't sure about. Or it could be that they saw a revertent. I don't know. But I think you'd still count that as a mutation. You'd count that as two, I would assume. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts about that one. Um, so I'm looking at the caption for it and it says each color, wait, it says black line represents the average total number of genomic changes relative to the ancestor in each sampled hybrid. Mm -hmm. Um, I would hope that, well, I don't know. I mean, I think, I would think that you would want to compare to generation zero every time if it was cumulative. That's, yeah, I, mean, I guess that's my question yeah. is, because it does say, just like you pointed to with, the, with the, uh, the, the caption, so it does say total number of genomic mutations accumulated in laboratory evolved hybrid and non-hybrid populations over time. So I was interpreting this as we would expect either no change because no additional mutations were accumulated from time point to time point, or you might expect them to go up. That's why I was kind of uncertain why one of those dropped. Um, I don't really know how that would work with, with presenting this as accumulated mutations. 
I mean, these are averages. So like the thing that I don't think they have errors or confidence intervals in this diagram at all. I mean, well, the, I think the averages are the black lines only, yeah? Uh, I think the black, the black solid line is the okay. average for the sample for all six of the hybrid lines. Right. The black dotted line, I think, is the average for the non-hybrid lines, mm -hmm. which I don't think they're showing us here. Because I think they did six lineages in the, um, I think they did six lineages for the hybrid. So that's what they're showing on the on mm -hmm. this figure. Yeah. I mean, the only other line. thing that I can think of is it looks like for every single lineage, though, there's either a level off or in the case of the red, a decrease. So I'm just wondering whether there was something systematically up with quantification at 1,000 versus... Oh yeah, um, that's true. That's true. So you got you've got mm -hmm. mutations accumulating from zero to five hundred. From five hundred to a thousand, you almost look like you've got a pause or a drop, and then from a thousand to fifteen hundred, you've got another increase again, and then you've kind of got another pause. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's I think if I rem I am not as up on the 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 uh, E. coli long term experimental evolution project in the Lensky lab as I should be. Um, but I think they've seen that too. I think they've seen uh, a period of of accumulation of of mutations, and then a period where you're seeing kind of a pause. Um, and I would say too that part of what you're thinking about here is um, single nucleotide polymorphisms and their frequency in the population. So you're you they they had to apply some kind of criteria about when they were going to classify something as a real change that they're seeing in the population because there could be a lot of mutations happening that are just not moving to fixation mm -hmm. or not moving to any kind of population frequency that they can detect very easily with the sequencing data that they have uh, which is something our lab I'm trying to think about for our labs experiments too is when you know what level of sequence what depth of sequencing data do you need and then what percentage of reads do you need to be seeing that change in before you're going to call it like, yes, this is a SNP that's moved into the population and it's currently at this frequency and it might move to fixation over these um, generations. Um, but yeah, so I, I, the thing that I thought was interesting for me is that, you know, our, our upper limit is no more than 16 mutations. If, if this is cumulative, if, if what they're showing is like, you get a total of 16 mutations. You, you, you know, it's not like they're getting um, mutations all over the place, and a lot of them. They've, they've kind of, the, the mutations that they're detecting are in the double digits, basically. Okay. All right, so this just shows us a number, but then they wanted to actually figure out, well, what's, what are these mutations? What could they possibly be impacting? So then they actually looked at this table where they looked at parallel mutations in genes for the, uh, the six lineages that were considering the, the ancient modern. So the modern E. coli that has an ancient tough gene. They looked at, and these are all the non-synonymous mutations. I think uh, they mentioned synonymous mutations in the text, but I don't think they've included those in these table because those don't have an impact on the amino acid sequence, which is what they're mostly interested in. So here they're looking at non-synonymous mutations that would cause an amino acid change. Um, one of the things I thought was very interesting about this, and they were, they were thorough to point this out, is that some of these mutations were previously reported in, in other experimental evolution projects. And so they're saying, as they mentioned in the discussion, they do discuss the possible role of experimental conditions, just the growth conditions, on the adaptation that happens. And so in some cases, uh, they, here, they, there might be some mutations in this table that they're not able to separate. Is this an effect of being grown in minimal medium, or is this an effect of trying to adapt to an ancient gene being plunked into your genome? Um, but as Nicole has already pointed out, one of the main things they noted was this region that's called uh, the, the THRT and TUF. So that is, the reason there's a, a slash there is because that's not within a gene, that's actually within an intergenic region between those two genes. 
And so these are mutations that are, are occurring in the promoter region for the TUF gene. So this is the endogenous, the native or modern TUF promoter for TUF B. And it's accumulating mutations in response to controlling the transcription of an ancient TUF gene that's been, that's been inserted there. So five out of their six lineages eventually got a, accumulated a mutation in that region which I think was really interesting. The neat thing about this is that you'll notice on this list there are no mutations reported for TUF. So one of their initial questions leading into this was, are we gonna be able to see a similar pathway from the ancient gene as we've reconstructed it to what we have now as a modern TUF gene where we start to see the gene accumulating mutations on that same pathway? And essentially what they've shown here is that over 2,000 generations, that tough, that ancient tough gene did not accumulate any mutations. So it looks like it maintained its sequence, at least over this time span, this time scale. And what happened is the genome neighborhood around it was what accumulated some mutations, which I thought was interesting. Um, any other thoughts on the table here? I was actually just thinking about this because it sort of goes back to your idea about um, the weekly selected, and, and or maybe it doesn't, maybe I'm getting confused in my head of it, but I think it's interesting to look at some of these previously reported mutations that have to do with just sort of general, well, they feed into general energy metabolism. So again, the idea is about thinking about what would happen if you sort of made ancient versions of genes that were more conditionally expressed and whether you would see either less compensatory mutation because the cells will probably just kick into gears when they need them that will have an up or down based on regulatory sequences that will will pull things through regardless of having to change sequence or whether you know you just will see series of mutations but not focused on on things here and the reason i guess i'm thinking about this is because when you're talking about something like an elongation factor which is overall involved in protein synthesis. I mean, that's one of those crowning energetic costs to the cell. And from the mm. biotechnology standpoint, you know, there's always this, the conversation about metabolic load and offsetting that, especially if you're expressing genes that don't belong to you from an organismal biology standpoint, which is a completely different context. But it is, um, I mean, this is sort of hand wavy, but it is just kind of like looking at the fact that things that seem to be altered really are you know, all the way down to translation initiation factors and DNA binding transcriptional repressors. So dealing with that whole site of our translation and transcriptional processes. Yeah, yeah, that's happening. true. As well as reg regulating your your cell division and, and timing for these these other large scale cellular events that really require overall metabolic configuration in some ways. They're not just niche things like I need the singular transporter for the singular very narrow nutrient requirements or a very narrow interaction. So yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And it's neat, like you get things like this cell division protein, FTSZ. Mm -hmm. uh, by generation 2000, five of the lineages had accumulated a mutation in FTSZ. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that implicates that gene in something having to do with the adaptation, whether it's an adaptation to the ancient tough gene or whether it's an adaptation to minimal medium and the temperature that they were growing it at, they can't really tease that out. Yeah, um, I mean, like, I think one of the holy grail proteomics experiments, when you've got, like, a changed elongation factor would be, like, frequency of either amino acid recruitment for those tr final translational products, or even just your budget of how many proteins get made the way they should be, typically, if you can do that by frequency versus what's happening in a cell where you haven't modified that gene. Yeah. I mean, this is a really blue sky, but I mean, I, that's something that I think about is sort of a big picture is, is what, what is sort of like the track record and sort of the QC like overall for making protein in the cell. Yeah, definitely, definitely. The other thing that this makes me think about on a, on a, on a completely, on a bit of a tangent, this, just the fact that they're seeing these mutations accumulate kind of makes me think about how much time we spend when we take an environmental isolate and then we bring it into the lab and then we grow it in the lab and you kind of lab tame it. Yes. I mean, even if you're going back to your freezer stock, oh man, it just makes me paranoid of like what you get if it's domesticated long enough in the lab. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like um, E. coli K12, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, we have a strain in our lab that's supposed to be MG1655, no. but we got the 16S data and it is not the MG1655 that is deposited in GenBank, which, you know, that's not news to anybody who works with E. coli, but it just makes you kind of go, oh God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, those little bacteria, ugh. Yeah, so Kat is saying, we think about that in the lab all the time. Yeah. We try to freeze our strains down as soon as possible after collecting it from fish. Absolutely, yeah. I've even thought about the fact that when we've done, um, for our predatory bacteria, I've even thought about the fact that if I'm freezing it down after growing it at a temperature that it not, isn't normally at, mm -hmm. like am I doing something to it that fundamentally changes how all my experiments go after I bring it back out of the freezer stock after that. It's enough to like keep you up at night if you think about it yeah. too much, I think. Um, at some point you just gotta go, these are my constraints and I'm moving forward, but it definitely is worth, worth keeping an eye on that and thinking about the ways in which we culture things and collect things, store things are potentially impacting what we can learn from them as we're expecting it to track back to where we originally got them from in situ. Um, yeah, we won't go any farther down that rabbit hole because I'll just give myself hives, so. Um, okay, so, all right, so then what they're gonna do coming out of this table is they, uh, they focus a little bit on the promoter mutations so I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Hopefully I'm not making anybody seasick by scrolling. Um, here, just at the top of this figure, is where they're kind of illustrating where the mutations are accumulating. So they're showing us the energetic region, and then we're showing us where the mutations occur. And what they're going to do now is they're actually going to uh, look at the allelic frequency. So this is what I was talking about before, about the fact that these mutations, when they're detecting them, are not necessarily at fixation when they first detect them at these different time points. So they're using their sequencing data to identify a single nucleotide polymorphism. They can try to judge based on the depth and the number of reads that the mutation is showing up in, what its frequency is in the population, and then they could try to track over generations if this if it changes in frequency and does it actually move to fixation so they're seeing it in, um, in all the cells, basically. Um, and so here what they've got is um, basically they're looking at the which mutations occurred and then their frequency over the time points. So from what I gathered from this, I think the green is, is that actually a, an insertion or a deletion? I wasn't sure about that. So there's a green underline of some okay. of the nucleotide. Okay, but, Nicole's like, all yeah. right. <laughs> I think that was like the nine amino acid deletion that they talk about later when they do more of the hardcore protein characterization stuff. So okay, or while well, they're calling it an insertion. Yeah. So, okay. That's why I was puzzled. Is that nineteen base pairs? 19 it is three. nineteen base pairs. Okay, you're you're a faster counter than I. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's maybe. Is two lineages that got the same are showing the I same? I think that's what the deal is with this. Like the same was, 19 base pair yeah. insertion. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it looks like that happens early. So it happens within the first 500 generations, and then it, it moves to high percentage in the population pretty fast. Um, it's in, it looks like it's fixed in, the, in lineage one. Lineage mm -hmm. two, it never quite, hit, quite hits fixation but it's, uh, it's in a high percentage of the, of the population. Um, and then they've got two lineages where nothing shows up until generation 15. And then they've got between generation 1,000 and generation 15, so over those 500 generations, not only did those, those mutations in lineage 4 and 5, the blue and purple, not only did those arise, but then it looks like they, um, they increased in, in percentage or they one of them swept to fixation over that period and the other is close and then at generation 2000 it goes up and it's in 100%. Um, so this really does implicate the promoter as being an important part of trying to adjust the cell, trying to adapt to the ancient gene. Um, okay, so then they're going to look at 
relative percentage. So they're looking at the, I think this is the amount of elongation factor that's being produced compared to, I think this is compared to a wild type. No, this is what Kat was talking about earlier. This is compared to the rel 606. There we go. All right. So this is, um, this is the, so C is actually looking at the growth, the expression of the elongation factor protein, and they're looking at it in the ancient modern hybrids, and they're comparing it back to, I think they're, they're, they're tough A knockout. That's the one that, that, um, that Kat had mentioned before. So I think that's what's going on there. But essentially what they're showing is they're showing that um, nobody has gotten back up to 100%, but I think it, it's an improvement over what was initially in the, um, when they, at time zero, I think initially the expression of elongation factor was much lower. Once they've acquired these promoter mutations, that improves the expression, so you get a higher level of elongation factor protein in the cells over time as a result of the mutations from the promoter. So interestingly, no promoter mutation reduced the amount of elongation factor protein, which you know you wouldn't think that would be a useful thing to do because you need it, but um, all of them basically increased it, so it's a, a protein dosage effect. And then here, I think we're looking at the effect on doubling time. If you overexpress the elongation factor protein, and I think what they're showing is that that decreases the doubling time. So it's going to increase the growth rate if you overexpress this. So the, I think this was a way to test the, um, the phenotypic effect of increasing elongation factor protein expression. Anybody want to add anything for that one? I don't know if this is something that like I should be amused by, but I thought it was impressive that both lineages with the 19 base pair insertion really are sort of the most effective at like. Yeah, one and two, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true in C there. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that's doing. What a 19 base pair insertion in a promoter sequence, what that would, would that, that would alter. Like I would love to see distance. a gel mobility assay for like whatever's binding there, whether yeah, it's like RNA polymerase, like do you just get better, you know, affinity? Oh, that's a good well question. Or stickiness or is there other proteins like, cause I mean that, that would also be good in terms of also thinking of the secondary structure of the promoter region too. I yeah, mean, that's what I was just thinking about. Yeah, how would that 19 base pair insertion change that, the binding sites, the distance between them? Mm -hmm. um, no, you're right. That would be um, that'd be a cool follow up if they if they are thinking about doing that. Is just mm -hmm. looking at like a shift assay just to see um, what binds to it and is is it they no that's something else where they talk about dissociation constant. I was getting distracted for a second. Yeah, no, that's yeah, the that's, stuff, and that's why I got confused by the lineage thing too. With yeah. The but no, I mean, like, there's this thing has some really interesting implications for thinking about optimizing protein expression too, which is why True. I'm kind of, you know, tickled by this because I had to rely on E. coli for my PhD for doing lots of heterologous protein expression. So thinking about, um, or protein production rather. Yeah. Uh, so, so like thinking about how these parts are rediscovering like the mechanics of what will make these work, what makes them work with genes when you're, you know protein synthesis architecture isn't quite what it should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Huh. Okay. Well, that, yeah, that's cool. Thanks for bringing that up. I hadn't really, I hadn't thought that through, but that's, you're absolutely right. That's neat. Um, okay. So then one of the things that they did was they, uh, they started talking about NUS A, and this goes back to this table right here. I'm going to scroll up, hopefully in a way that's not making people ill. Um, Lineage 6 was the only lineage that did not accumulate or did not, uh, a mutation in the promoter region did not occur in lineage 6. Instead, lineage 6 is these three lines at the bottom of table 1 where it has a NUS A transcription elongation factor, NUS A mutation, and then a couple other mutations. So they said, okay, well, NUS A and TUF should be interacting. So maybe we'll look a little bit at NUS-A to kind of see what goes on with that. And so, I mean, 
this is just amazing to me that they basically said, okay, well, we'll essentially do the same thing that we just did to reconstruct NASA just for figure four. You're like, oh, okay, all right. That seems like a lot of work. Um, and it just makes it into figure four here. So they did the same thing where they basically reconstructed uh, ancient NASA. So here they're showing the comparison between modern and ancient NASA. It really looks like ancient NASA is very different from modern NASA. So these are quite a few more changes than we saw with Tuff. And then here they're also looking at kind of the structure. And so we've got the predicted model of E. coli Nasse in B. And uh, they've also got in C the structure prediction of the mutant Nasse harboring a nine amino acid deletion in its C terminal domain. So then what they're going to do with uh, E here is they're looking at, so the way this is described is um, fitness change after deletion of Nasse from the ancestral and evolved bacterial genome. So on the left, they've got bacterial constructs with isogenic Nasse A knockouts are generated and competed against the native E. coli bacteria for fitness measurement. So I, I wasn't sure, this is not, they did, it, this is not comparing the Nasse ancient yet, right? This is mainly just looking at what happens if you've got modern Nasse, what happens if you knock out Nasse? Do you have an I, impact on fitness? I agree with that interpretation of what's going on here, yeah. Okay, good. All right. Um, so what they're looking at here is if you knock out, and they didn't include their, um, the, the, in the figure, they don't include the analysis that they did to show a significant difference. But what they describe in the text is that the relative fitness between just your modern E. coli and if you've got Nasse, Nasse knocked out, you do see a measurable drop in relative fitness. But if you look at the unevolved hybrid and the evolved hybrid, so where you have a ancient tough gene present in the genome, there is no difference in, in relative fitness between the Nasse and the Nasse knockout. And so I think what they're concluding from this is they were kind of wondering if Nasse and the modern if Nasse and Tuff are actually interacting. But from here, I think they're concluding that it doesn't. I think that was, did I interpret that correctly? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and I mean, the, they have the dissociation constants from the, the physical, like the checking, you know, actually directly checking it in the isothermal titration calorimetry experiment, which is basically dropping one protein into a solution of the other and measuring the heats of binding. And they were like, nope. Like, right. This is, yeah. Right. Okay. So they had implicated Nasse. Well, they had the, the, the occurrence of a mutation potentially implicates Nasse, but I think what they concluded from this is that this isn't, this isn't, re it's, it's not clear that this is going on. So here, what they've got at the end of this section is these results suggest that the Nasse mutation is neutral in evolved hybrid background, and the mutation occurred independently of the ancient EF to the ancient tough protein mechanism. So I think what they're saying here is, well, we looked into seeing if Nasse played a role here, but it doesn't look like it does in, in terms of what we're thinking about with tough. Um, anything in addition for that part? So I think the thing that's interesting about this, though, is that it's still relevant to sort of processes involving tough, even though it's not a physical interactor, because Nasse is what they're it participates in things called transcription anti-termination and also delaying, I think, some parts of the transcription to translational like flow forward in terms of protein synthesis. So the, the part that's interesting to me about this is that NUSE itself is actually used as a solubility tag in heterologous expression systems. Oh, OK. So it's not actually thought to physically interact with the protein it's stuck to the way that a maltose binding protein does in terms of like what they actually think it's doing is it may actually be targeting, again, these on-off rates for transcription termination, anti-termination. Again, I'm getting it wrong because I haven't had a chance to sort of quickly look at the definition of mechanism. But they think that, it's, that even though it's a solubility tag in this particular context, that its interaction is probably, again, with the transcript and not with 
physically interacting with with the protein, whereas the elongation oh, okay. factor is actually dealing with the um, transfer RNA recruitments and dropping things off, right? So oh, that's some part, yeah. So okay. I, I think that's really kind of neat because it could still be compensatory for inefficient protein synthesis on account of having an ancient EF2. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. So it's not, yeah. uh, I see, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, oh, so interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's also a good reason to know your biochemistry. <laughs> That's what I always tell the students. You have to know that stuff. Um, yeah, okay. Very cool. All right. Well, um, and that's, that's our figures. So then they kind of talk a bit about the broader implications of the work here. And, and seeing as we're kind of coming up onto 4 o'clock, I thought that this is a good opportunity to maybe kind of have some, we talked a little bit about broader things with this when we started, but this is a good chance to do a bit of wrap up um, and then, and in, as a way of kind of bringing this all together. Um, I mean, I think, I think the things coming out of this is that it's really neat to be able to see in an ancient reconstructed um, gene put into a, a, a modern context and then trying to figure out what's going on with it and being able to do that in an experimental evolution context I think is really neat. And I could see that experiments like this um, continuing, which I think would be really cool. Um, let me see. Oh boy, that's very bright. This, <laughs> my, uh, there we go. My office gets like this really interesting beam of light at about this time, so I always have to figure out where to go. Um, the other thing I think that's neat about this is trying to figure out what it's adapting to, how to tease that out, um, how to figure out, you know, how long would you need to give, if you want to see mutations in tough. How long would you need to go past 2,000 generations in order to start seeing mutations accumulating in tough? Would you continue? How long would you have to continue? And then what would that evolutionary, what would that mutational pathway look like? Um, I think that would be really neat also. Uh, and then as we talked about, there's a lot of implications about how each of these systems are kind of tied in with each other and how you could get a compensatory mutation in something else that may not be immediately obvious about what it's doing as part of an adaptation to tough. I think that's really cool too. Um, Nicole, do you have any kind of closing thoughts for this one? Yeah, I am kind of wondering a little bit about like if we were going to take bets on the molecular clock about getting EF2 modernized because looking back <laughs> at figure one, a lot of those white boxes are conservative substitutions of amino acids. So they have the same polarities and some great similarities of side chains, even though they're not, you know, there's a couple that are drastic, like that lysine that goes to glutamine at 210. I mean, that's a bit of a, a strange one because you're going from something that might be cationic to like an amide. Uh, so it's also just like these ideas. I mean, this is something that could also be explored by just mutating this protein and then doing more physical binding experiments. So like what, what optimization is good enough for a cell versus not? Because like my suspicion is that it would take a long long time if most of these are conservative amino acid structure changes. And you could like also, totally really I, I, I totally agree with you. I think another thing you could do, I mean, I, I don't know how they chose the time point that they chose to do the reconstruction, but another thing that could be kind of interesting is to look at, like, uh, you could, you could, you could start with a, a, a couple of different time points of recon differently reconstructed genes. So um, if you've got adequate support for doing this along a lineage, you could actually say, here's, here's the latest we're going to go back. And then we are actually going to try to reconstruct a couple of potential evolutionary pathways that would have led to us getting to the 500 million year old gene. And then you could reconstruct those and you could see how, what happens to those. Um, I mean, this kind of starts to like exponentially grow upon itself until you've all you're just swimming in flasks everywhere with replicate populations. But um, yeah, I think there's some cool things you could do here to try to because I think you're right. I think there's a there's that is a that is a, a small number of amino acid changes. It seems to me to be a small number of amino acid changes for such a long time span. So it really could take a while before you start to kind of see these mutations accumulating. Um, that's the thing where I'm slightly worried about with our work with the predatory bacteria. I'm a little afraid that um, 
we may not see that much happening over the time, the generations that we're actually able to do something feasibly. But um, nobody's really done it yet, so I don't know. We'll find out. Um, other closing thoughts? Not really, other than the fact that I really enjoyed the fact that you selected this paper, because if there is, I don't know, there's a lot to think about in terms of what what we think physiology is going to do and what we think what we sus what we are suspecting is going to change when we they started with that you know the whole hypothesis of like is ef2 going to be the thing that changes and and i mean that's the big thing that came out of here it wasn't and i mean of course we just discussed that but this idea that like your regulatory sequences are kind of something that you always have to think about you know, I mean, there, there's, there's the DNA part of it. And that's really, I think, I mean, there's the DNA and the protein part of interacting around gene expression. And, and I mean, even though this is sort of a well-worn, everyone covers in biology, I mean, it's, it's the cell sensibility, ultimately, when you don't have, I don't know, I guess, cognitive or other environmental sensing structures. So it's just this idea that, like, that's sort of, seeming in this experiment to be the linchpin of flexibility for the for e coli and yeah, I, I, that's true. it's sort of one of those stand back and and look at it and wonder kind of thing so i'm getting a bit sentimental about it but it's it's neat to actually see an experiment that brings that to light yeah i think you should absolutely get sentimental about it i think it's really cool yes i support that <laughs> um yeah, thank you. I think that's a good that's a good closing comment. And then I've got a note here from Kat where she said, uh, "This is a fun paper to read. I appreciated looking at compensatory changes both in amino acids and promoter regions. And thanks for suggesting it. Well, you're very welcome. Um, and thanks to Nicole and Kat for um, for popping in to to join me today to talk about this paper. Um, we are aiming to do another uh, journal club in April. So if people are watching or if you guys have suggestions for a paper you'd like to read, please feel free to share it with me on Twitter. I'm at MicrowavesSci, or you can just look for the hashtag MicroJC, as I try to tag all of our stuff that way. So if there's a paper you want to read, we'd be happy to cover it, because we're always happy to help people get through their to-read lists. So um, with that in mind, I want to thank uh, you guys for, for reading this paper with me. I thought it was a great paper. I might follow up with a couple of our questions with the author and see if she has some thoughts for us. And if, if I get some answers from her, I'll go ahead and post them to the website or as a comment on the YouTube video so people can um, follow up with that too. But otherwise, um, thanks everybody, and we'll uh, see you next time.